Ich alleine kann ihn lesen und auf dem Zaun der rote Hahn ist seiner Zeit in dein Herz gewesen. Die forscht auf diesen Zaun gespießt, geh ich nun graben, jede Nacht zu sehen, was noch übrig ist. Von dem Gesicht, das er mir Wow, nothing more evil than German. That was a little snippet of Hirat Mick from Rammstein, and it's lighting up the switchboards. Go ahead, caller, you're live on the Cinematic Asylum on CILU 102.7 in Thunder Bay. What's your question? Uh, hi, Layman, I'm Gerald, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Cthulhu Photogen, Gerald, what can we do for you? Well, I had a question about demons and uh, demonic possession and whether that kind of concept plays a role in post-therapeutic spiritual practice. Could you uh, say something about that and maybe connect it extremely tangentially to some form of music from movies or television? Demons. Great question. I'm glad you asked, Gerald. I do, in fact, think there's a real utility to pre- and trans psychotherapeutic models of psychology. Demons. On the one hand, we definitely liberate ourselves by getting away from oppressive notions of sin and moving towards more workable ideas like guilt and anxiety. But, on the other hand, the danger with the concept of anxiety is that it might be disempowering in the sense of letting you off the hook. The diagnosis of sin has the virtue of responsibility, and insofar as we believe we're responsible for our condition, we place ourselves in a power position. We put ourselves in the theological and existential driver's seat. Demons. Does anyone else hear that? Like a voice that keeps saying demons? No? It's just me? Demons. Okay, that is starting to creep me out. I'm, I'm just trying to say there's a balance between mythological and psychological models of sanity and decency. Demons. The problem with sin, of course, is that most of the time it consists of other people or even highly dubious institutions inflicting their needs onto the individual in the guise of accusing them of theological misbehavior, which coaches the individual toward obedience to authoritarian systems or even toward ultimate self-destruction. But the problem with just using a model of repression, anxiety, and the reintegration of abandoned elements of the self is that the full range, intensity, and power of the individual is often neglected by way of a narcissistic, self-enclosed, perpetual investigation into one's own feelings. I think Kierkegaard said something like that before I shot him. You risk raising fragile generations of people who take their own discomfort as an overwhelming Demons. crisis, and you risk a failure of vigilance in the face of forces within ourselves that might be so dangerous to our well-being and the well-being of our loved ones that we actually fail in our duty if we regard it merely as our own shadow work, our own neglected inner child, or some other non-integrated sub-personality. Maybe we only bring the adequate force of consciousness to bear upon the problem if we activate those instincts that evolve for alertness to predatory lions, bears, and wolf packs. And I guess the virtue of the demon metaphor in psychology is that it might offer us the chance to use those neural circuits that are designed to handle predators. And speaking of demons, from the Lost Highway soundtrack in which Bill Pullman is overtaken by a demon at a party and later murders his wife before passing into an alternate dimension where time flows backwards, here's I from the Smashing Pumpkins.
That was Smashing Pumpkins from the Lost Highway soundtrack featuring a psychological demon attack at the junction between two forms of reality. A more overt form of demon occurs in Clive Barker's famous film Hellraiser, based on his short story The Hellbound Heart, which introduced a new level of gore to cinema, intrigued us with his creepy puzzle box, Demons. and brought us the enduring character of Pinhead. Pen is the leader of a gang of demons known as Cenobites. They're rebels, alchemists, and troublemakers even as far as hell is concerned. Unlike the demons of Twin Peaks that seek to feast upon pain and sorrow, these beings feast upon the underlying intensity of biological experience. It's not that they want us to feel pain, but that pain is some exquisite overload of our neurobiological system. These demons consume and revel in sensation that goes off the charts, like a speaker erupting into whales of feedback when the microphone is too close. Now, we might suppose such beings would also pursue positive ecstasies like joyful bliss, but perhaps the reason an ecstatic experience is felt to be positive rather than negative is precisely because it complements rather than violates the structure of our authentic self. So Cenobites might require the high frequency of an energetic food that occurs only when the most basic self-organizing capacity of the organism is ruptured by a sensation so intense that it passes beyond the being's ability to embrace it. On the other hand, it might be that these mythic film creatures are merely the embodiment of the error that human brains typically make when thinking about such issues. Perhaps the Cenobites reveal to us that we pretend to seek intensity of experience as an excuse to wreck ourselves. Perhaps the demonic aspect, per se, is simply the one in which the logic of intensity conceals and enables a series of acts that directly pursue our own self-destruction. 
Cenobites are ugly, horrifying, and deadly. They indicate the movement of a human being toward physical disorganization, negative emotion, destructive relationships with others, and ultimately death. All your vectors are reduced to zero. Mind, life, aesthetics, zero. And while they appear to have some residual glamour as beings of ugly power, this may only be the false face that we present to ourselves when engaging in self-destructive activities. Maybe we're being unpleasant and hurting ourselves and hurtling toward the abyss and scaring our loved ones, but we reason at least we're exhibiting some darkly beautiful intensity and demonstrating our fundamental power and maybe making our point in some basic way. But are we? Or is that just a lie we tell ourselves as the demon takes hold and pursues its single-minded agenda, the ruination of us? From the original Hellraiser soundtrack, here's Lament Configuration and Re-Resurrection by Christopher Young, with a jaunty palate cleanser in between.
You just heard a couple tracks from Christopher Young on the original Hellraiser soundtrack, followed by something called Jazz Traditional Charleston by Eric Markman. That's famous for being in the movie Creep Show as well as at the end of an episode of The Evil Dead. The Evil Dead, of course, known for its relentless and hilarious presentation of undead monstrosities and demons. The Slovenian philosopher Slavo Žižek has often compared the Lacanian notion of the drive, as opposed to a desire, as being something like the undead in cinema. Like a zombie's hand crawling around by itself, a stupid force that keeps going endlessly, unaware of whether it's living or dead. Not a death drive in the sense of driving toward death, but in the sense of driving endlessly in such a stupid way that it's suffocating, terrifying, soulless, pointless, pre-human, and might as well be dead. Living forever in the twilight, learning nothing new, clenching relentlessly onto pointless objects, doing laps eternally for a brain-dead coach, circling a burned-out sun, biting everything, including the hand that feeds you, crawling towards your victims even after the heroes shoot you with a shotgun, turning, twisting, and enclosing over and over and over again. So Zizek constantly invokes the notion of the undead as the best way to think about the Freudian death drive through the lens of Lacan's philosophy. For some reason, Lacan is big in Slovenia. The sheer stupidity of drives is a matter for mockery, and we do in fact find a lot of humor in the depiction of the undead. In the film and television series Ash vs. Evil Dead, from which we just heard some music, we take the lameness of the exorcist-like demons and let it slide into obscene comedy. The endlessly encroaching, never-dying, always-crawling demons of the Evil Dead universe have their lame remarks appropriately parried by the crass pseudo-wit of the beer-drinking, chainsaw-wielding, small-town yokel whose catchphrases are so lowbrow they come across as ironic brilliance. And why not? If it is in the DNA of demons to desecrate our lives, then maybe the proper response is to mock and humiliate them, in addition to killing and dismembering them.
That was Something Wicked This Way Comes by Barry Adamson from the Lost Highway soundtrack, a masterpiece in the depiction of demons. 
Before the break, we were talking about the show Ash vs. Evil Dead and the way that it uh, turns the lameness of the presentation of demons found in things like The Exorcist into something more approximating humor and how that might be an appropriate response. What did I mean by the lameness of The Exorcist demons? Well, the first season of The Exorcist show on Netflix was way better than the second, let's just say that. It follows the life of the little girl from the original Exorcist film, all grown up and now finding her own daughter subject to possession by the Sumerian demon Pazuzu, who can only be thwarted, apparently, by rogue Catholic exorcists. Now, we don't even have time to get into why Catholicism is so linked to horror, why even atheists find horror movies more convincing when they feature Catholic churches and the demon-fighting spells of the official Demons. liturgy. Maybe it's an intrinsically haunted institution. Maybe there's something about large official and ornamental religion in any culture that seems to promise control of the supernatural and superstitious forces of existence, but that's a show for another day. Right now, we want to think about the film The Exorcist and the memorable presentation of demons that it created. The combination of William Peter Blatty's writings and William Friedkin's directing was intense. I heard a rumor the director kept setting freezing cold temperatures on set so everyone could see their breath and periodically firing a gun into the rafters to keep all his actors on edge. What everyone remembers, of course, is Linda Blair floating, twisting her head around, crawling on the ceiling, projectile vomiting, and yelling coarse profanities at everyone around her. This presentation of demons has become classic and is perpetuated in the Exorcist television series, and it's interesting because it's both gross and lame. What do I mean lame? I mean juvenile, predictable, hollow. You might remember in Fight Club that prospective members of Tyler Durden's army were made to wait on his doorstep for several days of constant verbal abuse. If they were tall, he said, tell them they're too tall. If they're fat, tell them they're too fat, etc. This very obvious push-button form of insult is also employed by demons in the Exorcist franchise. Mothers are told they're bad mothers. Pretty people are called ugly. Positive things are discussed negatively. God is cursed. Everyone is called dumb. And the most obvious possible swear words are tossed around with ease. Very predictable. Very reactive. Very lame. At first, I thought this was a fault of the writers, but the more I pondered it, the more I came to wonder whether this lameness was actually an intrinsic feature of demons themselves. Is evil lame? Hannah Arendt famously referred to the banality of evil, and that might be related. Perhaps demons lack the capacities that produce wit, novelty, and creativity even in their attempts to perpetuate evil. Perhaps the desecration of aesthetic intelligence goes along with the desecration of everything else we value. If you love a tidy room, the demon will kick your table over. If you think vomit should be on the inside, a demon will vomit onto your face. And if you think dialogue in a film should be fresh, interesting, and unpredictable, then a demon will speak in ways that are so pathetically lame and mechanical that they exhibit about as much cleverness as a glue-sniffing adolescent spray-painting the inside of a concrete tunnel with the only two offensive words his degenerate brain can come up with. Billions of blue-blistering barnacles. From Twin Peaks The Return, here's The Veils with Axolotl. <laughs>
the dark trees that blow, baby, in the dark trees that blow, and I'll see. My grade four teacher was Mrs. Aquatagatis. We used to call her the squirrel because she'd keep erasers in her cheeks the same way a squirrel holds nuts and acorns. I remember her because she sort of woke up my interest in how we view the cultural assumptions of our ancestors. In science class, she would tell us about how people in the Middle Ages thought that sneezing and seizures were the work of demons inside the body. She said it with such a triumphal and supercilious tone, we couldn't help but picture these poor, ignorant people of the past who foolishly got themselves born before the existence of even one electric machine. They didn't know about germs or brain electricity or, or the outer reaches of the galaxy, so they had to make up stories about demons, just like the ancient pagans were apparently so bad at science they had to make up stories about gods and goddesses. Generally, Mrs. Aquatagatis gave us the impression that our ancestors were like imaginative children trying to do physics and cosmology and failing because they lacked the tools of modernity. They were trying to do our science and they were failing. They just weren't us. And there may be some truth to that. I do like stories where we're all slowly evolving and that means our ancestors were, relatively speaking, living a miserable, ignorant, and deluded life. On the other hand, we almost certainly misjudge their actual intelligence. Monotheistic scholars tend to scoff at pagans for being too dumb to recognize the one God, and secular scholars tend to scoff at monotheists for about the same reason. In all that scoffing, it's pretty plausible that arrogance is sneaking in somewhere and discoloring our lenses with unnecessarily judgmental hues. Hi, I'm Unnecessarily Judgmental Hugh. You might remember me from such films. That day in class with Mrs. Aquatagatis helped me develop my own critique of the way we contextualize people with putatively primitive worldviews. 
I remember thinking to myself they might have meant something different by their words. What if they used the word demon, consciously or unconsciously, to mean something like a biological crisis or disturbance? If the word demon means biological disturbance, then it is scientifically accurate to say that a sneeze or seizure is a demon at work. Ever think about that, Mrs. Aquatic Goddess? No, I never did. I didn't think so. But I forgive you. What? On the other hand, that isn't how I think about demons anymore. I think about them more as anthropomorphic autogenic nihilism. What the hell does that mean? What is nihilism? People raised on the Big Lebowski, the nihilist Lebowski, or, or even on conventional academic institutions tend to think of it as a condition in which people assert that they have no beliefs and no values. People who cannot find meaning in traditional structures and start to view the world as a directionless void of pointless matter and death. But the word nihilism was largely popularized by Friedrich Nietzsche, who assumed that most nihilists are actually people who think they're idealists and believers. His idea was that not all values are equal. Some values are opposed to reality, opposed to life. Ideas like going to another world when you die, or treating matter as an illusion, or going along with the group's rules even when it kills you, might be ideals that lead to personal regression and the denigration of your own experience of reality. You can have all the values you want, but if they're opposed to your own experience of reality, then they're leading you away from the source of that which gives you the power to value things in the first place. Once in a while, these hollow, self-negating values burst into the open and leave people wandering around saying they believe in nothing, but the nihilism was there all along, in self-defeating value structures. It's slow suicide at the level of a culture, at the level of cognition, and we have to be good diagnosticians in order to ferret it out. For example, if you think the world is whatever people believe it to be, that life is whatever you make of it, then you might be secretly believing that the pre-existing nature of being is just an empty void before anyone does any of those things. And that's a pretty suspicious thing for a natural creature to believe about the pre-existing nature of being. It seems to project meaninglessness into the heart of reality under the guise of a truthful or positive stance. Nihilism, oper <laughs> Nihilism is operative at many levels. A culture that undermines itself, a heart that rejects its own emotions, a mind that gets stuck thinking impossible thoughts, or a social being who inhibits its own social nourishment, or even a body that prefers toxic empty foods to rich, complex, and healthy foods. Nihilism is suicide, and maybe we all have a suicidal strain in ourselves, a thanatos, a death instinct. A demon might just be the way of personifying that trend in all its forms, that risk, that recurrent self-destructive tendency in all beings. Anthropomorphic autogenic nihilism. Self-neutralization imagined as an active entity. At least that's how I imagine demons. I'm Layman Pascal, and you're listening to the Cinematic Asylum Demon Edition on CILU 102.7 FM on LURadio.ca around the world. I haven't even had time to talk to you about the possibility of subtle energy vortices that feed on pain and suffering, or my theory that Ted Bundy may in fact have been possessed by a demon. Nonetheless, we've reached the end of the episode, and here's an extended remix of the Chromatics Performing Shadow from the Twin Peaks Return soundtrack. <laughs> 